Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to episode 10 of Monday Musings. Your hosts, Iram and Irada, are here with a returning guest speaker, Um Khalid, mashallah. As you already know, Um Khalid is a homeschooling mum of four, which recently stirred some controversy within our community with her latest post, which is why we decided to get her on board, because we really need to get to the bottom of this uh, feminism issue and the questions that we will be addressing today uh, what is feminism and what is real women empowerment for us muslim women we know the the dynamics of society ha have has changed so much since the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but we also know that we have clear roles and responsibilities that um, stated, you know, within the boundaries of Islam as Muslim men and, and as Muslim women, which are universal, timeless, and this should not be causing controversy at any time. So inshallah, we will be addressing few questions which may uh, trigger or stir some emotions. Um, I also want to disclaim that um, we are not oppressed or abused by our husbands. <laughs> and also, uh, they're not waiting behind the door, forcing us to say things that we are going to say, inshallah. So, um, I'm Khalid, over to you. What is feminism? Where does it originate? You know, how, yeah, how did it become such a big part of uh, today's society? Yes. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you so much, jazakumallah khair, for having me uh, today. And this is a very important topic, I completely agree. Uh, it's been talked about in social media over the past few weeks, I guess, and people have been raging in different comment sections on different posts, some of which were mine. So um, it definitely is a pertinent topic for, for us today. Um, and the first question I think we need to get to the bottom of is what exactly is feminism? So let's start there. Feminism is, there's uh, some different definitions of feminism. If you talk to feminists, they'll say it's one thing. If you talk to, you know, d different people. But uh, basically what is important for us as Muslims to realize is the reality, the truth and the, the, the root of the matter. And what that is, is feminism is an offshoot of the colonial project. Feminism was started in the 1800s as a very, very atheistic, anti-religious movement. And it has different waves. It has, you know, we've all heard of the first wave feminism versus second wave feminism versus third wave feminism. And some people will kind of argue that we're kind of living now on the cusp of fourth wave feminism, right? But actually, this is something my husband uh, talks about uh, a lot in his kind of discussions on feminism and his uh, classes on feminism. It's very interesting. And I agree with this, which is that there's actually a zero wave. This is, I really like that term. So I'm stealing it from him, the zero wave of feminism. And it actually comes before that first wave because this is really where it starts. So when you say, what is feminism? Where did it originate? Right here. The zero wave is colonialism, the beginning of the colonialist project. When Western powers wanted to go and invade different countries, not necessarily only Muslim countries, they wanted to take over certain lands because they had certain resources. So it was very economically driven and very political in nature, but they can't just go, right? Like to think about it logistically, you can't just go as a Western superpower and just start like invading and raping and pillaging. That's not gonna fly, right? People are gonna look at you as the aggressor that you are. So what do you do? You have to be smart, you have to be clever and sneaky. You gotta have a pretext, right? And we know this even today, whenever a country wants to invade another country, there has to be a pretext for war. And we see this right up until our modern day. But for them in that zero wave in the 1800s, what pretext could they come up with? They had to come up with something. And they were extremely intelligent. They came up with this pretext. The savages, we have to, we have to uh, develop the savages. We have to civilize these savages. And you know what these savages are doing? They're abusing their women. They're dominating their women. And it was the savages who are Muslim, the Muslim savage, the Chinese savage, the Indian savage, different indigenous peoples. They were all savages to, to the Western mind, right? And they called this, they had a specific name for this. This is the white man's burden. The white man has to go 
forth across the globe and civilize these crazy barbaric savages whose women cover in hijab and in niqab like you see me and you wearing. And women were uh, at home, nestled in the home. And this is oppression. How dare you keep your woman in the house where I can't see her? How dare you keep her out of my reach? This is oppression. She must be so mad, <laughs> you know? I can't see her, so she must be oppressed. So this is that mentality. This is really, this is the zero wave of feminism. So the first feminists, contrary to I think popular opinion and to maybe what feminists even will tell you, the first feminists were not women. They were men trying to rape and pillage and steal other people's lands. So then what happened was, uh, you know, fast forward years later, this actually the same sword that they used against the other got turned around and it got used on them. The chickens came home to roost. And then feminism became a thing that actually Western women started to judge their own standards by or their own condition by. So they started to get indignant and huff and puff. <laughs> the church, the church is actually um, a patriarchal and it's actually holding us Western women down. We're the ones being uh, you know, oppressed by our men. Patriarchy is, and so this is actually one of the main tenets. This is the cornerstone of feminism, this idea of patriarchy. And it existed from that zero wave, which was, it was very crude. It wasn't sophisticated, but the Muslim savage men are holding back their women. They're oppressing their women. That's like the, the kernel uh, that started this idea of patriarchy. And then first wave, second wave, third wave, they all um, expanded and, and uh, kind of uh, like they took this idea and ran with it. They expanded this idea of the patriarchy saying, uh, with the first wave, they, the women were saying, the Western women now, it wasn't, you know, in different lands, it was in Western countries, they started saying um, the church is actually really patriarchal, and the church is holding us back. And this is why I say, make no mistake about it, feminism is very, very atheistic from its outset, from when it first started, it was always anti-God, always anti-religion. And, um, you know, just as very small examples, uh, there's a woman, Elizabeth Blackwell, she wrote what is uh, a book titled uh, The Women's Bible. The women's Bible, because who's God to write the Bible? God is a man. I can write my own Bible. I'll write the women's Bible. I'm a woman, right? That was a thing. Susan B. Anthony, right? Another huge uh, founder of feminism, a raging anti-God, anti-religion atheist who hated men, right? So this is where feminism comes from. If you want to ask where it originates, this, ladies, this is where feminism originates. You tell me if that fits our religion, if that fits our community. And then second wave, third wave, same thing. It only got worse. It's only descended further and further into um, depravity and into uh, just like degeneracy, right? So the second wave feminists, they didn't focus so much on the church and like they progressed way beyond that. They started saying, well, um, everything is a social construction. We can't, there, there's no gender rules. Who are you to say that a man needs to go out and earn and provide for his family and a woman needs to stay home and you know, work within the home and raise children? Who made that up? This is completely made up. This is not uh, reality. This is not biology, it's just social. It's all cultural stuff that we're imposing, again, because of the patriarchy, right? We're oppressed, so we need to go out and do whatever we want. And then the third wave, this is the final uh, main thing, main part of feminism, they started to descend even further, where now we have to be sex positive, we have to be body positive, we have to uh, own our own, um, you know, we have our own agency and we can do whatever we want, including be extremely promiscuous. We need to have access to abortion, my body, my choice, uh, intersection, intersectional feminism, because I'm a woman and I'm brown or I'm a woman and I'm black. So it's just, it became, you know, subhanAllah. So I, I think that's probably enough of an introduction for now. I'll let you guys uh, take it from here. Would you like to add something? No, I'm enjoying this. Is, this is lovely. I mean, I don't have to say anything. I'm just going to nod my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the bottom line is, you know, the, the idea of feminism, the way it originated and the way it uh, developed and the way that it pushed into people's minds as an ideology, that is not compatible. That's not compatible with Islam, right? And there's no need for that. There's no need to fight for, um, you know, equality of women when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gave us this that status, right? It's, it's like when something is up there and it's so obvious, there's no need to fight for it. And yes, women today are oppressed, but not necessarily Muslim women and not necessarily by Muslim men. 
that's the nature of humanity that, you know, sometimes men abuse women, sometimes women abuse men, right? And um, unfortunately, yes, you know, the abuse takes place in Muslim societies, just like in non-Muslim societies, right? Who says there's no abuse in the UK or in, in Western countries, in Europe, in USA? It takes place everywhere. And it's giving that, you know, label that, um, oh, it's Muslims who oppress their women. It's Muslim men who oppress their wives and labeling, labeling, you know, framing and boxing them putting them in that corner and then starting the fight against it. It was, yeah, like you said, the, the project of the colonialist powers, right? And subhanAllah, and we have a lot of women, Muslim women who pray, who fast and who are outwardly, mashallah, very practicing, but they still fall into the traps of feminism because... Yep these messages have been pushed down our throats you know from such a young way age and in such a subtle ways you know in in a very subtle ways mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to completely uproot all of that ideology like even even when i start practicing you know it was very difficult to uproot all of it out of my mind like when i got married right it was very difficult. Like you keep thinking like, oh, why should I make his tea? Why, why should I serve him? Why should I do this? You know, I'm an educated woman. I went to university and I'm working just as hard. And these messages keep popping up in your head. And yes, it is the whispers of shaitan, but it is also these subtle messages that we have been brought up with. What do you think, ladies? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so <clears throat> I was in the category where I was a practicing Muslim and I said, yes, I'm a feminist. I used to proudly say it, and that 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 most common example that they use, may Allah forgive me, my my, my jahiliya, still learning. But Prophet Sallallahu was a feminist, right? That that's the most thrown around statement because he took care of the women, and he and it was through the Quran that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave the rights of um, um, property and land, and women were said that they are not like they they cannot be treated like cattle and sheep. That was Allah who said that, right? Uh, and then the idea was my favorite teacher was a feminist. My favorite actor was a feminist. My favorite singer was a feminist. My anywhere I go, they were feminists. They would say they are feminists. And I would see good people, like you said, good people, good God conscious people saying that they're feminists. So, and I did not do my research. Nobody, like, it's, it's, it's like thing, you know, when everybody is doing the same thing, then you do the same thing. You don't, you don't think about it twice. It's only when your need rises that you have to study that you, figure it out. And oppression has always been and will always be the, the fabric of human nature. It's not going to go away. Whether it was past centuries or whether it's the future century, it's not going to go. It's going to come in one way or the other. And subhanAllah, we humans are so, <laughs> so simple and so complex. Shaitan is like cruise mode. From day one, these are the five things that he did. And then he just plays onto them and people think, oh, the complexities have increased. No, <laughs> it's pretty simple. You just hate God, make believe that man is bad, make believe that one is the oppressed, the other is the oppressor. They're going to fight together. And at some point, what has happened as the one who was saying that I'm oppressed has become the oppressor. The, the feminist wave, these, these women or these intellectual women, these learned women have become oppressors without realizing that what, what they're doing to themselves and to the girls who are going to come in the future and what they're doing to the young boys because we had this very good conversation like we have these shirts uh, girl power go girl blah where are those shirts for the boys what what are what are these young children these young men who are going to become men soon inshallah what is the message to them so there's no there's no balance subhanallah Next question for Um. <laughs> yes, subhanAllah, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, like, like I mentioned, yeah, the, the conversation that I had with a lady from Pakistan, 
I just want to mention it again for the benefit of the wider community. And um, so I was talking to this, uh, shall I call auntie, she's much older than me, and she belongs to elite circles of Pakistan. And she comes from a very wealthy affluent family. And she was born and raised in Pakistan, but she grew to an English medium school all the way through. And even her university education, she finished in England. So um, she, she grew up with the idea of women need to go uh, get education, work for themselves. And she was trying to explain until I, start, I, until I came to Islam, although I was born and raised in Pakistan, which is you know, a Muslim country, mashallah, and a relatively conservative country as well. But we, the feminism you know, was pushed so much at schools at uh, our circles that you need to go, you need to study, you need to work, otherwise you will be your husband's slave and you will just be serving your mother-in-law day in, day out in the kitchen, you will have nothing to do, wasting your life. And these kind of messages, you know, that they grew up with, um, it came with a big emotion. Basically, she was, she was saying that they played up with our emotions and that's how they made us feminists, right? They grew up with th this idea that I'm an independent woman, I should go get education. Not that there's nothing wrong with the education, but then, you know, the, the, on the other side, they bring that if you don't get education, you will be serving your husband, you know, all your life, basically. Like they're, they're still serving your husband still. Yes, <laughs> I mean, like, you don't go get education, not, to be, you know, like not to be a companion or not to be like, how does that idea even like, you know, do, do you get me? Like, subhanAllah, mm -hmm. and then subhanAllah, she, she came to Islam, right? She started practicing and she, she, mashallah, gave up her career as an accountant. And uh, she, by choice, uh, uh, started, you know, being a full-time home, looking after her children, and all her friends in her elite circles, they all have turned against her. Although she made the choice, right? By her own choice, by her own will, 100%, that not, nobody oppressed her. They were all like, they couldn't accept it. They yeah. couldn't accept that, that uh, independent education, uh, educated, uh, affluent, wealthy Muslim woman could give up everything and just choose to be a stay-at-home mom because she just wants to care for her husband and children and just be home, right? And um, so that's how they left her, basically, right? It, it, it caused a big stir in her circles as well and uh, subhanallah this like you know Khalid, like you were saying that the same women who want to support women does not want to support you when you make choices that they don't agree with right yeah uh, i mean uh, look at sorry look at it like this that um the feminist movement they don't support the women who who choose to become mothers Oh, you want to be a mother? You want to give birth? That is basically you are propagating the idea that you are going to become, you're going to give descendants to the man. <laughs> so yeah, they, they have this, like the whole, there's this whole, like, we are going to support women. Oh, you chose to get married. You chose to, you chose to birth. Halas, you're not from us. Uh, but um, another thing to that is in Pakistan, another thing happened, like when we did not study the religion properly and we gave it to, to people who were, um, who were getting their source of learning, which was not authentic and everything was haram and it became so suffocating that also propagated in this notion that the people who, who say that they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they are abideen are basically rigid minded, closed minded oppressors that, that instigated this whole idea a lot too. Inshallah, bismillah. Um, al-Khalid. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you guys. And uh, I just wanted to add my own kind of experience to the mix, which is very similar to the sister that you were just talking about, uh, Sister Iruda. So basically, I, um, I went to Harvard, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah, and the, I met people there. A lot of people were feminists there, obviously. 
uh, these liberal arts colleges, whether it's in America or whatever other country, they tend to be like just hubs of atheism and feminism, right? And I just walked into that like a naive 18 year old, like la la la, and just like got smacked this wave of like raging feminism. And it's like in academia, it's in the stuff that you read uh, for, you know, the, the uh, academic works that you are being assigned you know, the sign reading every week for different seminars and classes. And so it's just everywhere. And the people that you're meeting, like you said, you know, they're all like, I'm a feminist, I'm a feminist. So I totally went along with that also in the same way. So Hanallah, our experiences are very similar. And I think these are the experiences of many kind of modern Muslim women just living today in today's society. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm a feminist. And yeah, men suck and women go girl, like women's girl power and all of that trash. That's the stuff I was parroting, I was parroting uh, mindlessly, you know, I just, you know, and, and it's so ironic because if you say other than this, then you're parroting stuff mindlessly for the patriarchy. But if you parrot stuff mindlessly for feminism, you go girl, you are smart, you're a free thinker, you know? So it's just amazing. Like if you say, things of your own volition, of your own will. Your husband is not telling you to say this stuff. No, you're an idiot. You don't mean that. Your husband is making you say that. But if you say the stuff that they're saying just mindlessly, if you're repeating their little mantras, the feminist mantras, they're like, wow, you are such a critical thinker. You know, you're extremely intelligent. I'm very impressed. <laughs> you know, so this is what it is, man. This is, and we don't talk about that, but it's such, it's such hypocrisy. And it's so, it's such a, it's just, it's, I don't know the word. It's, it's hypocritical and it's like a farce. The whole thing is a farce. It's a joke, you know? Anyway, so then I was a feminist. I was this raging feminist on campus with all these feminist girls that I was meeting, Muslim and non-Muslim. I mean, I didn't do anything crazy. It's just that I would call myself that. It's not, you know, I, I was just, I was a Muslim, but in my head, I thought, and, and my understanding of feminism was extremely superficial. It was very shallow. I just thought feminism was, oh, you think women should not be oppressed? You think women are like human beings with some rights somewhere? Sure, I'm a feminist. If that's feminism, then we're all probably feminists. Like who wouldn't be a feminist except like uh, a bigot and like an actual like psychopath, right? So I was like, oh, I'm not a psychopath, I'm a feminist, sure, <laughs> you know? Then like way later down the line, I realized all this stuff and I started like looking into um, the history of feminism, like everything I was just telling you guys earlier, the, the, the colonial project and how men used it and how it was like for political gain and invasions and the, that wreaking havoc upon the entire Muslim world. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not, I don't want to be associated with any of this. And just all of these other harms that maybe we'll get into inshallah of feminism. I was like, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to put my name anywhere on this mess. This is a mess. I'm not, I'm out, you know? So I just left. I was like, no, I'm not a feminist. Then when you go to an Ivy League school or any, any university, whether it's in Pakistan or elsewhere, then, and you've associated yourself with these like feminists or these kind of like more liberal Muslims or they were your friends. And that was the case with me, some of them, you know? SubhanAllah, then they turn on you. Just like you said uh, with that story of that woman. <laughs> then I started uh, kind of, writing on Facebook very recently, a year or two ago, um, and, you know, writing non-feminist stuff. And I, <laughs> through the grapevine, I heard uh, some, someone told me that, oh, you know, I met some of your friends slash acquaintances <laughs> as a question mark. I don't know if these people are your friends, but basically this person was saying, and so these people that you went to uh, at Harvard, the Harvard Islamic Society, they were saying that you are, you used to be independent. You used to be really smart and empowered. You used to be a feminist, used to be. Yes, the operative word, used to be. <laughs> and now you are your husband's puppet. So, because you're basically saying whatever he is like, stuffing into your head whatever he wants in you to say case, in your case your husband has a very loud voice on the topic so yes you do get a burn from because you're just related with him so <laughs> That's of, my that is, yeah that that is one <laughs> of the things that you get a lot of a lot more hate just yeah the they're like you used to be so smart you used to be so free you used to be so liberated what happened you got married i got married at the end of college before i graduated and then i you know i was married and then other people went on to medical school law school business school wall street here i was i was like married like an idiot i felt like an idiot i was like oh i'm not doing maybe i i better do i, I was like scrambling i was thinking i was very i was not a feminist but i was still uncomfortable because it takes a long time to detransition and get out of that mindset. So I was struggling like, oh, what's my purpose in life? And I wasn't a mother yet because we, we got married young, my husband and I. And so I was like, not a mom, I was a wife. I didn't know what that meant. And I was not a feminist, but I didn't know what else to be. I didn't know how exactly 
like where I fit basically. What does it mean to be a woman who's not a feminist, but still doesn't want to look like an idiot who's just a slave to her husband that she just married? You know, it was just, I was very confused. And anyway, so long story short, then I became a mom. Alhamdulillah, I have four boys now. And I'm homeschooling and I'm just I'm home because I'm so invested in the home. I mean, I'm not just like a mother, but I'm like also homeschooling, which takes up a lot of your time. And it's it's a job in and of itself, right? You're basically a teacher. And subhanAllah, and you have many other projects and things going on, but none of that counts. I'm just a puppet, I'm a slave, I'm my husband's servant, et cetera, et cetera. This is what people see. But subhanAllah, it's just basically this idea of choice. Feminists will give you choice. Their whole, what they claim, the claim to fame for feminists is, oh, we just want to give women choice, which that's a foot in the door. That just sounds nice. It sounds like, oh, okay, who would disagree with that? But no, subhanAllah, that's not what they want. It's not it's not about choice. They want you to choose their specific choice. If you choose any other choice, you are blackballed. No, you're you're done. You're not a feminist. You're a puppet. You're a slave. You you are not intelligent. You don't have a mind. You don't have a voice. They will spit in your face because you didn't choose the choice they wanted you to choose. So what kind of choice is that? You know. Yes, subhanAllah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with. Can we just clarify? You know, a few things that people misunderstood and misinterpreted from your original post yet. Um, Islam did not say that women should cook and clean and remain in the kitchen for their entire lives after they get married, yeah? And uh, also working outside the home is not prohibited for women. And um, getting education also is not prohibited. But the bottom line is home and children are the main responsibilities of a Muslim woman, right? And I want to mention that the, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this is Muttafaqun alayh by Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet ﷺ talks about the responsibilities of different, you know, people in different categories, yeah? And this is a very famous hadith. There's no uh, um, disagreements about this, right? Every one of you is a shepherd and responsible for their own flock. And he talks about men and he talks about, you know, other people, but specifically when it comes to women, the Prophet وسلم, said, women is responsible for her husband's home and children. Home and children. These are the two things that we are hold responsible and accountable on the day of judgment, right? The two things, there's no disagreement. But if you, if you take care of these, feel free to work right? Outside the home, if you want to, yeah? And uh, feel free to get educated. You know, no, but there's no, there's no restrictions. Islam does not uh, put any restrictions with regards to women getting educated or working, but it's very clear, home and children are our main responsibilities, and we will be held accountable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these two things, right? And I, there are so many um, women who, you know, like feminist women, who always bring the example of Khadija radiallahu anha, right? <laughs> always bring the example of Khadija radiallahu anha. And they always say like, oh, be like a uh, tradeswoman like Khadija radiallahu anha. And I just want to clarify, Khadija radiallahu anha married twice before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on both occasions, the men came from affluent, wealthy families. And on both occasions, they died. So she inherited some wealth from her previous husbands. And yes, she went into trading, but she was not going in the caravan to Syria, to, you know, to Damascus. She employed men and she was basically investing, right? SubhanAllah. And it's amazing how they use the example of Khadija radiallahu anhu, you know, for, for their own... Um, advantage and another thing is we need to make one thing very clear we need to make one thing very clear there's a lot of pressure on um, on women today right on women today and we have a lot of women who push the idea of you can have it all you can have it all no you cannot have it all right you cannot have it all. You can like, it's impossible. You can't tick all the boxes in all areas of your life. You know, you, you, somewhere along the line, you struggle. And I talk this from experience. 
And I took this from, you know, my um, own experience and the experience of hundreds of women that I speak to on a daily basis. You cannot have it all, subhanAllah. So if you have to prioritize, at some point you feel like you're losing the balance and you can't maintain the balance between deen and dunya and you will have to prioritize, then it will have to be home and children. It will have to be home and children. And that's what that's what according to the Prophet Sallallahu said. That's not from me, that's not from Am Khalid, that's not from Iram. That's according to the hadith of the Prophet. So what what are the uh, the gender roles in today's society? You know, why we got so mixed up, why we got so messed up, and where to draw the line. These are the next questions, uh, inshallah. Then we will be uh, wrapping up, inshallah. Inshallah. I just wanted to add this one thing that um, ask any liberated woman today who has to pay the bills and who has to raise the children and who has to run errands. And, it, and when she sees a Muslim woman in her house taking care of her children, she says, just, just because you say la ilaha illallah, just because you wear this, you're living a life like this for, for, for the women who are mashallah taken care of by their husbands, right? And alhamdulillah, there are a lot of us who are actually taken care of by our husbands. So two things come in. No, if we would have checked all the boxes, this was not this wouldn't have been dunya, it would have been Jannah, number one. Number two, this, that those women say, oh my God, if I could just exchange my place with you, if I just don't have to do all, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. And you see, you listen from you listen to this to this from the the feminist women, then uh, and you listen to this from general women. Women are usually they they take the burn, they take the burn when they're taking care of the family, when they're taking, and it's a natural process. I always bring up this example, and it amazes me. You tell me the wife of Umar Khattab or the wife of Abu Bakr or the wife of Ali or the wives of the wives. There was not one wife, the, the wives, right? The wives of all these Sahaba Karam. Uh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them. They took the burden of raising the Ummah. The best, the best of the people that, that, that walked on the earth were the people in the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then there were Tabi'een and then there were Tabi'een, tab right? Th that's that's how they say it because, because of the level of Iman and what they gave to the deen and Tell me which of these were raised singularly or when in a home where the father was present and the mother was present and the mother, <laughs> yeah. I feel that it has always been like this. The women have always been uh, taking the, the, the burn of raising the children and it is completely okay. And subhanAllah, they, they grew up to be Qadis and scholars and all of this. And, and of course, their fathers stepped in and, and it was a whole tribe system where everybody was taking care of everybody. So, so, so there's so many factors. The, the first factor to me is um, loving and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if that comes, then everything just starts falling into place, I, I believe. Yeah, I agree with you, Iram Allah. I, I definitely uh, agree with your perspective there. But going back to what you said, Sister Iroda, the, if someone, if, if another person starts bringing up Khadija radiallahu anha or Aisha radiallahu anha and starts to, to say things like, they're so cliche and they're so tired and old, these little one-liners. Khadija was a businesswoman. She was a CEO radiallahu anha. Aisha was a tenured university professor. I, I don't know. I'm going to lose it. If someone says that one more time in the comments, like I... I'm so tired of it. I'm sick and tired of this because it's such a mis it's such a falsehood. It is such a twisted fact. It's it's like a misused, you know. I want I want to add something uh, so that I just don't forget. And please do continue. If yeah. Khadija was such a feminist, why would she take food of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Hera? Yes. Walk so many miles. Why was she doing it? Exactly. She, she was she was affluent, she had slaves. They would like take food for him. <laughs> Why was she going? Yeah, it, that's absolutely right. Like, I just have such a, I have such beef with this type of mentality because it's so 
wrong and it's so twisted. You basically are nitpicking and you're like cherry picking things like from here and something from there and something from down here. And you're just like throwing all of that together like word salad and saying, there, there's Islam. Islam is feminism. Like you just, you just cherry pick. That's not the whole narrative is here and you're just grabbing little bits and pieces here as fits your narrative. And you want to try to, de de you know, delude and deceive all of us into thinking that this is the entirety of Islam when you know that these are exceptions. So basically the Khadija thing, just to put this to rest, inshallah, for uh, our sisters. So we stop saying this. Khadija radiallahu anha uh, was the, I mean, subhanAllah, she had money, as you said, Sister Iruda, from two husbands who were deceased. And she herself was raised in a very, very wealthy family. Her father was the leader of the, a, a certain tribe. And she came from money, basically. She didn't work. She didn't go get her Harvard business degree from the Harvard Business School. All right. She wasn't an MBA. All right. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. She, was, she inherited a lot of this money, or she inherited all of this money. And then she gave up on marriage after marrying two different men. And they both died. She was a widow twice. And she said, you know, Know what like I'm, I'm good and she was known as a tahira in quraish she was sayyida yani sayyida min sayyidat quraish she was a, yani, one of the noblest of women you know sayyidat in quraish and people were pursuing her left and right she was 40 years old and she was pursued relentless, relentlessly by wealthy uh important men and leaders of different tribes who wanted to ask for her hand in marriage and she was done she was you know but then, alhamdulillah, she, met, she heard of the Prophet Sallallahu and she met with him and she employed him to do the trading for her and then she uh, married him, alhamdulillah. But not, nothing about the story is feminist. Just because she had a business, she had money, again, that she inherited, and then she was not dominating. I think we have this mental image of like Khadija radiallahu anha from that time. We like fly her over to like 2021 and we're like oh she was dominating the boardroom she was giving powerpoint presentations what she was home all right she was home in her house and the money was being um uh the trading was happening by she employed many many different men because she had to find men who are trustworthy who are honest who are not going to cheat her who aren't going to be stealing her money or misusing the merchandise and so she was, it was, but she was home. She didn't travel. She didn't travel with the caravan, like you said. She, it's not what we think, basically. She didn't leave her house to like run meetings, nothing, right? And then, uh, then the Prophet Sallallahu as soon as she married him, he took over the business with her blessing. She was like, yeah, I'm, I'm out. I, I was, I had to deal with this money and like work with the money that I was left by these previous husbands. Now you're my husband, here you go. And he took over the business as a man, right? She didn't do the things that I think we imagine her to have done. She did not do that. She is free of our tainted thoughts of this modernistic ways of thinking that we have now. We're trying to like back project it or backpedaling into the past, trying to project that onto her. Radiallahu anha. And she was a tahira. She didn't have these things that we have. Aisha, same thing. Radiallahu anha. Umm al-Mu'mineen. Aisha radiallahu anha. She was not a tenured university professor who dominated the lecture halls of Princeton University or Stanford University, right? She was home. She learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as one of his wives. And she knew a ton of ahadith and all of these incidents that she could narrate to us as very few people could other than Aisha radiallahu anha. So uh, Sayyida Aisha she taught men, she taught the Sahaba uh, from behind a hijab, min hijab, from behind a veil. She was not standing there, you know, in whatever kinds of clothing. Again, we, we have these mental images, right? These associations that we make with the feministic, like, cesspool that we are, like, immersed in. So we think, oh, Aisha radiallahu anha was, like, a teacher. She was standing with, like, a whiteboard behind her, and she was, like, teaching men. They were all sitting right next to her. No, get that out of your head. That's not how it was. This is tainted thoughts that we have today, and we are unfairly and inaccurately back projecting them onto the past and onto these, uh, um, you know, uh, pious, pure, righteous women that were our... Um, so we need to stop doing that because it's it's very annoying. It's not right. It that's is, that's it my is. little rant on that. No, no, alhamdulillah, it makes sense. Though. The only one thing that I want to add to it is women, when they come across men who tell them that there is a, there is hijab on a woman's voice, that the woman cannot be a reciter, that the woman cannot uh, cannot be an educator, that the woman needs to, her, her place is in the home. You know, that kind, those are the triggers of these women. And that is why from the very onset of this conversation, we started off saying, know your rights in Islam, not the rights that people tell you, but read the Quran, because without that, we will never ever arrive to this, this complete understanding uh, that what, because a, 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 an empowered woman is a woman who can tell 
like like the, the, the woman in the time of uh, Umar the Allah one when he was going to put a staple on on what the haq mahar should be and she stood up and she said Umar Allah did not put a price on haq mahar how come you can do it that was an empowered woman so th- this this un- the, 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 this this word empowered has to be linked with how Allah empowered us and not with how the right the right wing and the left wing does it yeah i agree and i think that if we want to know what the islamic rights are we have that and i think this is really when we're getting now we're getting kind of deeper we're getting to the crux of the issue here basically as you guys have both indicated i totally agree with this some of these uh sisters who have fallen into that feminist trap some like me just didn't know anything about what feminism actually meant and we just thought it was like a nice little oh yeah women are good i'm like okay yeah, generally i agree you know but some of us, uh, subhanAllah, so that's the case with some of us, and then we snap out of that, alhamdulillah. Some of us, it's actually, we're pushed into it because um, of different things that we've seen. And they're real. They are completely real. Nobody's denying that. If you know a sister who's like your best friend and she got married and then her husband abused her physically or verbally or emotionally, whatever, right? That happens. I'm not saying, oh, that has never happened. You are such a liar, right? You're not. You're not lying. That really happens sometimes. But that is not a, do you remember how we were talking about the colonial project and how feminism was a pretext for a war? It was just an excuse. It was like concocted to get their foot in the door in those countries and just really just take over. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to come out and say that, hey guys, we're here to take over. Is that is that cool with you? <laughs> you know. So they needed a reason. And so I think the reality of women being abused or women being like oppressed by certain men, and it's only certain women, right? So certain women being, um, having the rights that Allah has given them, having those rights taken away by certain men, that is a pretext. It's like a Trojan horse, right? You, you use that to get your foot in the door so you're in, right? So you're like, oh, women, we need to give women back their rights and the, right, the, the God-given rights that were given by Allah in Islam, right? We're all going to agree with that. Who's going to say no? Sit down. We're all going to say, sure, we agree. We're Muslims. But then you get your foot in the door that way, and then the Trojan horse you know, everything's unveiled. Then the stuff that was hidden inside comes out. Then, oh yeah, the Aurat Marsh, oh, my body, my choice. I can wear whatever I want. How dare you tell a Muslim woman how to dress? How dare you tell me that I can't work outside, you know, nine to five? And, you know, how dare you tell me to be a mother? How dare you tell me to do this or that, right? Then that's the, the chaos ensues. But in, we all agree and on that very first step of does abuse sometimes happen to women? Sure, we all agree. I would never deny that. I don't think any of us here would deny that. Right, that happens. But the other side of it too is that some women are the abusers. Some women, again, it's always some. We're never, we're never going to generalize because that's just not the reality. Some women also abuse some Muslim men physically. I know, I know. I used to actually, like, literally as recently as two or three years ago, I was arguing with my husband about um, do can women physically abuse their husbands? I was like, come on, but I, I didn't know that. I didn't. I just wasn't. I had never seen that. Well, I was so naive. <laughs> I was so naive. I thought that's not really possible. My husband's a foot taller than me, and he like he's he's we're physically we there's a huge disparity, right? I'm very short, and he's very tall, and he's much bigger. And so I thought there's not if I wanted to hurt you physically, I wouldn't be able to. Like if I tried, it would fail, right? So he was like, no, that's not the case with everybody, and this is true. And this is then as you know, just over time, I've literally I have seen cases, I have heard of cases, friends telling me, female friends telling me, my brother, his his wife physically abuses. Him physically and he has always been taught that he can't hit a woman even if she hits you don't hit back you let her hit you or you try to get away try to escape from her but never strike back even if she's hitting you so he's this poor guy has been taught that from boyhood and now he's a man and he's getting beat and he can't hit back yeah women abuse in two ways mothers abuse their sons we abuse our sons right now is villa uh in in emotional way in physical way when we hit them and we keep hitting them and we keep amusing them with words. That is mother-son thing. But wives, uh, women generally throw stuff. Yeah, You don't have to like punch him in the face. You just, <laughs> have you seen like women when they lose control, usually when we are we are so emotional and we are so tra- traumatized by whatever is happening and we can't make sense or we are going with that, whatever we are going through, the, the mental illness, et cetera, et cetera. We just start throwing things. Okay, a woman is throwing things at a man. She is frustrated. A man is throwing things at a woman. Yalla, tell me what that is. <laughs> go to jail go to jail boy off you go <laughs> i'm we're not we're not saying it's okay for either one of them to do it we're not i'm yeah. not saying that, <laughs> just saying that? that look at how funny it is 
it's a double standard. We're pointing out the double standard. And it, you're absolutely right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, endorsing any of this. You're right. I think we do have to make that disclaimer. So yeah. And, and so, but women have so many ways and, and some men, basically, if you want to abuse, if you want to do volume to another person, you will find a way, whether it's physical, verbal, emotional, financial, psychological, you will find a way to make sure that person is oppressed and you've suppressed them in an unjust way. And Allah hates volume. And it's yes. not like, oh, Allah hates men doing volume, but not women. Women are okay. And no one is allowed to be a volume. This is hated categorically by Allah. And we're told to stay away from volume because Allah will, uh, you know, take the, the due of that person from you on Yom al-Qiyam. So this is something very serious, actually. But it happens on both sides. And I don't think that we acknowledge that. This is something, another blind spot of feminism. But we just, it's never, it's rarely talked about how women can themselves uh, enact violence and abuse. Mm -hmm yeah yeah oppression takes place abuse takes place by both genders by all nationalities by all ethnic groups and i think it's very dangerous to um, associate this to any specific group or gender or place or time because you know it happens right subhanallah muslim non-muslim white black you know brown it happens and there's no denial it happens and uh, muslim Oh, like you said, subhanAllah, you know how this has been the pretext for some colonial powers to enter and put their feet in, right, to take over, subhanAllah. And um, just a final thoughts, ladies. So feminism is the, the, the way it originated and the way that it has been pushed as an ideology is not compatible with Islam. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have our rights given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, there are things that are, you know, there are things that where there are difference of opinions in Islam, right? The, the gray areas. But when it comes to roles and responsibilities of men and women, there is no difference of opinions, actually. You know, there, there's no disagreement. It's not like other issues where we have ongoing debate about, you know, which one is right. No, it's very clear. And actually this has never been an issue until very, very recently. And we all have been the, the what well, like, we all have got the byproducts of womanism, you know, feminism, like we all picked up basically. We all picked up the byproducts of feminism along the way. And it's not something that's clear on the billboards, right? It's like from books, from maybe songs, from movies, from something that you watch, from some conversations that you have with people. And it's very important that we understand our role and responsibility as stated in Islam, right? What does, the, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? with regards to, you know, women's role Islam. And what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say with regards to um, women's role in Islam? Everybody has to go dig deep and study, study and find out for themselves. And inshallah, may Allah guide everybody to make the right choice, to make the right decision, inshallah. And let the Quran be Furqan, right? The clear the criterion that where we need to draw the line. Let the Quran be that Furqan, that the criterion to draw the line with regards to our roles and responsibilities, rights and duties, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts from you, ladies? Yeah, I would I would like to go so that the end thought is from Um Khalid, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> because Sister Iroda made made sure that Um Khalid gets a platform. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I reward you, Sister Iroda, for this and Um Khalid for your efforts, mashallah, tabarakallah. Two things that came to my mind, two examples. And please yeah, um, help me, uh, on, um, you know, if you know the correct hadith or the correct ayah, please do help me. But I will say this. The two things that come to my mind is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he was reciting an ayah to Hatim Tai's son in the Quran tafsir when you hear that. And the, 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 the ayah was that you follow your priests as if they are God or you love them more than God or something like that. That was the context of it. And uh, the son of Hatim Tai, he said to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no, this is not true. Well, how, how are you saying this? He said, well, you did not study the book. You gave them the right to study the book. They, whatever they say you do, 
which which is basically Christianity. Why why did this whole thing happen? The the the, the revolution had happened because the people did not learn the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever the the leaders or the religious leaders told them they said okay fine Islam does not teach us that it says iqra the first message is iqra read we have this why have we given this right to other people who will um taint or you know belittle our rights by telling us oh Allah is saying this so basically what you're doing is you're giving the right of learning and loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to somebody who actually is not loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the dhalim is the human so this is a human issue it's just a human issue the oppressor the men the women all are oppressors and the second thing that came to my mind which um, subhanallah is that hadith where uh, Prophet Sallallahu said that you will follow the Christians and the Jews in the dark night, like the dark night in the dark, uh, on the dark rock, uh, something like that, that, oh no, not that one, the other one, where, where, if, where you will follow them until you, they go into a hole so deep and you, you, you do follow them, right? Something like that. So it, it makes so much sense to me that we are doing these two things together and we are losing our, our focus, our identity and this openness to learn. That's it. Oh, I, Allah, that was very, very well said. Jazakumullah khair. I completely agree. You know, that was very uh, profound, actually. We are following people step by step and, you know, inch by inch until they go into the lizard hole and we follow, right? We go right in there after them, subhanAllah. And that's not what we're about. That's not what we're supposed to do. Um, I guess the final thing I would like to say is just to highlight what this is really all about. Um, the, the purpose of every human being, as we all know, is um, I have not created, uh, I haven't created the jinn or the human beings, humankind, except to worship me. So that's one thing that I think, as you said so beautifully, Iran, this is one thing that we need to keep as our focus. This is, I'm not here to fight with men. I'm not here to compete with women as a man, right? The two genders do not have to be in this eternal clash every day, just butting heads proving who's superior. No, I'm here. No, I, you're here. And putting each other down to try to get on top and be feel better about ourselves. Or it's, a, there's, it's not a war that we need to win, which is one of the downsides of feminism. It creates this dynamic of a war scenario. We're in this war situation, constantly battling it out, like the battle of the sexes. And as Muslims, we don't subscribe to that. We don't submit to this crazy notion in the first place. Like, so we just like get out of that and say, we are awliya of one another, right? Uh, we are awliya of one another. We, we love each other for the sake of Allah as brothers and sisters in faith, in Islam. And we love Allah. Our connection is, is to Allah primarily and then to each other as an ummah. So there's no fight. We have no beef with one another. We don't need to get into that. These are for the non-Muslims. They don't understand life. They have no connection up here to the creator. So they're just here, down here with each other, just like duking it out. So we don't need to follow them down that lizard hole. Why are we doing that, right? And then the second thing I would like to say is just basically aside from our function as slaves of Allah, we are also, um, there needs to be a focus on the family, right? One of the main like destructions of feminism, and it's a big word, right? The halak, this is really halak, destruction that is wreaked by feminism is the destruction that is wreaked upon the family. The family is being destroyed and we can see that. I mean, if you don't, if you haven't noticed that trend happening in the culture and the society that we're living in, then you're you're missing a lot of stuff, you know? But marriages are, are breaking, people are getting divorced, divorce rates are climbing, in, including within the Muslim community. We're not immune to this. We're not in a bubble where we're living outside of these realities. We, it's hitting us hard, the Muslim community in general. So the family is under attack. Right. I think that is a reality. The family is under attack and no society can ever be a strong society if it's not built on the strong foundation of a strong Muslim family. So if you attack the family and you break it down, you've attacked all of society. You've broken society down, which is another thing the colonial project aims for. So we're helping them along. We're like, oh, you want to you want to destroy us? Go right ahead. The mom is going to go out and do this. She's not going to care about husband or children because she's suspicious, suspicious of her husband because he may oppress her. She has this sneaking suspicion that he's an oppressive male. This is the patriarchy. He's part of that conspiracy, this male conspiracy against her as a woman, right? So you've got this deep mistrust that you've, you've basically created between man and wife, right? And, and the husband will have feelings of resentment and anger, and maybe he's going to start neglecting his duties. 
right towards her. Maybe he's not providing because I think this is another reality that I've heard um, some women will message me, especially after the post about try to prioritize being a woman, being a wife and a mother, feminine in the home, family oriented. That was basically the gist of my post. People lost their minds because they were like, well, my husband is not a provider. How dare you tell me what to do? And how dare you tell me to not rely on myself? I need to rely on myself because I can't rely on this, dead, on this deadbeat. He's a loser. I can't rely on him. And to that, I say, we all need to remember our roles in the family, right? I'm not excusing men and justifying their behavior if they're doing what is wrong. We never, like, we have to just state the truth plainly because we are witnesses for Allah. I do not care about men specifically or favor them over women, but I certainly don't favor women specifically over men either. None of this is, is ad, right? Or ad. We have to be just and we have to kind of uh, say the truth, whether it's for us or against us. And so men have certain roles and they need to fulfill those roles. They have to be qawam. They have to, and not in the sense of like, what feminism defines as a man's role, like basically be a carpet for women, be it just like a, just a doormat. That's your role as a man. That's not, we don't subscribe to that, right? We have our own understanding, understandings Islamically of what our role, uh, what the husband's role is. So the man has to fulfill that role in the best way, right? And the woman, she has her own role in Islam. And we subscribe again to the Islamic definition of that from the Quran and the Sunnah, what the woman is supposed to do, and she needs to do that. And this will have cohesion and unity and beauty and warmth in the family. This will create love and strength in the family. And then no one can break us. If you have that cohesive unit, right, full of love and full of unity, man and wife and children, and all the roles are being uh, fulfilled and taken care of, then inshallah, if we have just imagined one Muslim family and then another Muslim family and a third and a fourth, then it creates a whole society of sound, healthy Muslim families. That is a very, very strong society. And we need to get back to that. So it's not about we have to prove our worth or we have to fight with men and dominate them because they've dominated us. So by God, it's our turn now, you know, <laughs> it's revenge and payback is this. Or, we need yeah. to get out of it. Right? It's yeah. not a competition. Just get out of that mode. Yes, Ex except except the position of men as leaders right subhanallah and this is something that islam highlights a lot you know if, if like uh, if three men goes on a journey and then the, you must appoint one uh, as a as an imam right a leader and if there's no leader there will be chaos and when it comes to family we should not shy away from stating the fact that men is the leader of the family as prescribed by Islam, right? Somebody, you know, lazim, somebody must have that final say, somebody must make that final decision, right? And that has been given to men. And we as Muslim women should have no problem accepting that because this is something that has been prescribed by our religion, right? SubhanAllah. Yeah. The position of leadership has been given to men when it comes to family. Yes, they, they, they are the leaders, right? And uh, subhanAllah, you know, again, we have fallen, you know, uh, into the trap of feminism and a lot of Muslim women have a hard time accepting this truth, a very hard time admitting that, no, it has to be equal. It has to be, you know, no, there, there must be one leader. There must be one one person who has that one, one final say and subhanAllah. Yes, I want to, I, I want to, I, uh, funny, funny, funny. Okay. This is not, this has nothing to be serious about because uh, a leader, uh, men are, uh, men are the leaders is a big trigger. So I don't know if somebody was with us, I may, probably we're going to lose somebody here, but <laughs> listen, when we say men are leader, this is what we mean. Men is the head, you are the neck, the head rules where the neck goes. Hold on, just understand that. <laughs> You, you have your job, woman. You have your job. Like yes. the thing where Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when, when he was upset with the Sahaba Karam uh, and As-Salama radiallahu anha, she said, you do this, they will follow. Now, who, who was being the leader here? Like intellect, intellect is, and, and, and the fitra and, and, and the goodness, it will all come. It will all come. Just, just having this label is not going to, you know, diminish our role. Just remember, you're the neck. The head is moving where the neck is moving. Oh, you're in charge. <laughs>
<laughs> I really like that, you know. And the other thing too, I, I really like this. I think this is actually an important point to uh, elucidate a little bit because you're right. People will get triggered and will say, oh my God, I was with you until you said that whole bit about men being leaders. No, 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 you know. But I think you're absolutely right. We have to clarify what we mean. We don't mean tyrants. We don't mean dictators who are just making these sole decisions that like the exact opposite of what you want. He's going to decide the opposite just to annoy you and just to like that's not the reality of marriage. I think what the problem, the other problem with feminism, this is like problem number 20 so far in this podcast. There's so, so many problems. The other problem with feminism is that it's all based in theory and not actual reality. It's like detached and unhinged from reality, divorced from the realities of like what marriage, marriage actually looks like, especially a healthy, sound marriage. It, it, feminism is very far from that. Right, it's very removed. It's like academic in books, and it's just like black and white. It's like text on a page. But when you actually live life, and you're actually in marriage with a decent person who's like a healthy husband who doesn't have anger management issues or you know all of these psychological problems. But if he's like a, and this is the average Muslim male, I would argue the average Muslim male is a normal, healthy guy, right? Um, so exactly. So if you're in a marriage with a husband, you will see that you know Allah says, "Wa ashiruhuna bil ma'roof." Wa ashiruhuna bil ma'roof. And have ishra by nakum ishra is it like a life, like a day in, day out, daily life thing. Bil ma'roof with what is known, i.e., what what is good. Like just be a decent person. You know, just have like a good life together. This is what Allah commands. Wa ashiruhuna bil ma'roof. And another thing, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Wa la tansa wal fadla bi nakum." I love this ayah. This is actually a short part of it's like a short snippet of a larger ayah in the section of Surah Al-Baqarah about uh, at-talaq, about divorce, but also um, marriage, like marriage and divorce. It's really beautiful. If you can have good khuluq, and if you cannot forget fadl between you as you're getting divorced, you know, Allah, then definitely isn't it like more incumbent that even like for marriage, you will definitely have fadl between you amongst amongst yourselves, right? Fadl meaning bounty, graciousness, deal with each other with kindness and grace and, and be uh considerate of your spouse you for him and him for you right this is so it's not this like oh he's a he's a leader he's going to step on your face as he marches on and makes his own plans against you this is not a man this is one thing Allah, as i get older i understand this reality a lot more in a very deep way and as i like live my own married life and uh before you say oh well you're an exception i got that a lot in the comments you're an exception you've got a good husband that's why you're saying all this crap you know no, most Muslim men, this is how they are. Brain, uh, you were being brainwashed by feminism to project onto like most Muslim men that they're just like horrible human beings who can't think. They're just big brutes who are just oppressors by nature, right? This is not the case. So if you are... Um, Oh, this is oh, this is what I was gonna say. So the the you know over time, I can see through my own life and many many other people's lives that men are. It's like subhanAllah, it's really beautiful. They have this. They're like programmed to care for their woman you know subhanallah maybe like they even want to protect all women like uh, the man is like a protector right so if there's and if you think of hunter gatherer societies men want to protect the entire tribe and who do they protect the most women and children more than anybody so the man will throw himself in front of a bullet to take that bullet for you before it can ever hit you or a child it doesn't have to be his own wife or his own child he doesn't care he's just like he's a martyr he has that instinct and he'll dive head first to to take that bullet for you right like in drastic situations and i i know that we don't live in these drastic situations every day alhamdulillah we're not in a war scenario but this is what men are programmed to do and in a marriage what what does that look like how does that translate to a marriage and how that translates is basically he will do he wants he's programmed to make you happy he wants to make you happy he wants to please you this is I have seen that in my own life and I didn't since I had that feminism trash like lingering in the back of my mind from when I was younger I went into marriage with like a lot of suspicion like oh here we go better watch out for the abuse that I know is coming you know and what I got back shocked me I was floored I saw like my, my husband was like bending over backwards trying to like oh do you want to do this do you like I was like where's the abuse that I heard so much about this this is this a joke this is like are you like punking me like do you know what I mean? Like I just had these bad expectations that I was going in with, even though I had kind of tried to um, detach myself from this dumb label of feminist and all that, but there are lingering doubts and these lingering things in the back of your mind, like, I guess I'm going to get abused any second now. I have to put my back up and have my guard up and, you know, but men, the, the reality is so far from this. Men in real life want to make their wife happy as much as they can if it's possible of course sometimes it's not possible and you get into fights and you're not happy or he's not happy and this is real life right you fight with your siblings you fight with your 
parents sometimes and you fight with all kinds of people. So of course you'll fight with your husband. He will fight with you. You will anger him sometimes. He will anger you. Then you make up and life goes on. But by default, a man is programmed to make his woman happy. He wants to do that. When you're happy, he's happy. He feels like a man. He feels like he's doing his job and he's doing it right. He's killing it because, oh, look, look how happy my wife is. I must be doing something, right? She's very happy and I, I'm like, right? Like I'm making her happy. I did that. So he feels good about himself, right? So I think we miss that. Feminism just destroys all of that. And in one fell swoop, it just kind of does this, it like hand waves all that away. It's like, no, 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 no. None of that is real. Men are abusers. Trust me. Subhanallah. Yes, absolutely. You're right. I think it's been 20 minutes since we said uh, final thoughts, and I'm sure we can all go on for another two hours discussing feminism and gender roles in Islam. And um, But we will have to stop here, inshallah. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in to today's podcast, uh, Jazakumullah Khair, please participate, join in the discussion in the comments section, and share this with friends and family. Uh, we want to be part of the solution for the ummah, inshallah. So, um, yeah, share it with friends and family. And um, I would like to thank Um Khalid for uh, coming on board again, inshallah. And we look forward to connecting with you all virtually in our future podcasts. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.